Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Carissa Carbon about what we need from our leaders today to respond to the Great Resignation. Carissa Carbon, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful to be here. It is a pleasure to be with you today. I'm super excited to have a nice conversation. Uh, today, we're going to be focusing on the great resignation, and we're going to talk about leadership in relation to this current uh, context around a really tight labor market and explore what we need from our leaders in order to respond to the current context, to this great resignation. As we get started, I wanted to share Carissa's bio with everybody. Carissa Carbon is a leadership coach who helps corporate leaders achieve career mastery through introspection and impact. She specializes in helping you become the leader of your own life in order to serve and empower others. I love that. Uh, Short and sweet, anything else you would like to add by way of your uh, professional background, anything else uh, that you think would be helpful to the listeners by way of your context before we dive on in further? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Not so much in terms of background. I'm sure it might come up organically, but wanted to take a moment just to acknowledge everyone who is listening and participating today because the human experience has been a challenging one for all of us over the last 18 months. So just want to acknowledge you and appreciate you for being here. Yeah. And it's important for all of us to continually be developing and growing and learning and, and trying to figure these things out. Nobody has it all figured out. I talk about this with with people like you every day, and uh, I feel like I have a decent sense of things, but I still learn new things all the time. Like we all have stuff to figure out. And and so it's just wonderful when we can get people together in these types of communities to have nice conversations and explore further and in greater depth uh, the types of issues that really are at play uh, in our own personal lives and our organizations and how we can be more effective with those around us. Uh, Maybe I can ask as we get started, uh, how did you find yourself in this space? Uh, what what kind of brought you to being uh, a coach and uh, working with uh, corporate leaders in terms of how they can be more effective? Yeah, absolutely. I have close to a decade of corporate experience in the tech industry, and I've done a lot. I joke that I'm the Jane of all trades, master of none. Uh, and over the last few years, I have I've had a lot of leaders myself, and I've had the opportunity to be a positional leader, right? You know, I I think it's good to differentiate between the position versus just feeling like we are a leader and leading from where we are. But I've had great leaders who have set an incredible example for me. And I've also had terrible leaders who have shown me exactly what I don't want to do as a leader and who I don't want to be. So for me, as I have looked at society and I've seen the tremendous power that we give to our leaders and that leaders have, I see so much of the impact and the downstream effect of leadership, good and bad. And it has just become, quite frankly, my calling in this life. And this is my life's work. That's wonderful. And and there really is so much need. We've all been there. We've all had those cringy leaders. Um, cringy is probably a nice way to put it sometimes, <laughs> right? Um, you know, we, we've had those those bosses or those leaders who have just been, you know, toxic and painful. Um, and, and then we've had others that have been really exceptional and the exceptional ones tend to be pretty rare. Um, and we're, we're fortunate when we have the chance to, to see that in action. Um, but each of us, you know, even if we're kind of currently the cringy one, <laughs> um, we, we have the opportunity to develop. We're not stuck there. We don't have to just say, well, this is how I am. And, and there's nothing I can do about it. I, I don't believe that for one second. Uh, that's why career uh, and leadership coaches like yourself um, are, are out there because there really is a great opportunity for development. So as we talk today, 
uh, about what we need from our leaders. I want to do that from a developmental context, uh, recognizing that, yes, we want to try to attract the, the right types of leaders for our organization that have a fit with our, our mission, our purpose, what we're trying to achieve, um, that, have, that have shared mindset with you know, where we're wanting to go. That's always the ideal. Uh, but we also have people that are already in place and we want everyone to be able to develop into their full potential and become you know, who they're meant to become. Uh, and, and we can do that as we're just deliberate about it, as we pay attention to it and we're consistent doing some basic things consistently over time. Um, as we get started, let's talk a little bit about this great resignation. Now, everyone's, of course, heard this term uh, many times by now, but can you provide a little bit of context for us? Uh, what, what are these current conditions that have now arisen to this label, this grand label of the great resignation? I love this because... Mm -hmm. What I like to call this is not the great resignation, but the great awakening, right? I think we've all collectively been living through trauma, quite frankly, um, big T, little t trauma. And I think that as we have awakened into the world that we're living in, the conditions we're living in, many people are resigning from their current jobs, right? <clears throat> as we look around and say, how did I get here? How am I living this life? Why am I living this life? And what kind of life do I want to live? A lot of people are either taking time away from work, right? Because they're burned out, because they're stressed or because they have, uh, they need to mourn and they need to grieve the loss of loved ones. They simply need to prioritize their family or they are finding better opportunities at different companies. And oftentimes when we feel this sense of languishing, we think to ourselves, if I change my circumstances, things will get better, right? And so I think part of my mission is to help all of us understand that the circumstances may make things better in the short term, but unless we're digging deep and addressing the root cause of the issues that got us to where we are, then it will only be a short-term fix or a Band-Aid. Yeah, and, and there's, there's certainly... Uh, situations where there are really bad conditions. And of course, we would say anyone who's in an abusive situation, you get out of there, you move on, you get safe, uh, you get to a healthy environment. Um, but what right. you're just what you're talking about is something a little bit different. We all find ourselves in less than ideal situations. I, I, I don't really know very many people who just think I, I have I have it made I have found, you know, the pinnacle of my uh, work experience and everything about what I do every day is what I love. And I, everyone I work with is perfect. I don't know many people like that. And so most of us have things to grumble about. Most of us have things that frustrate us or annoy us. Um, and, and that's just the way it is, right? We're, we're fallible human beings bump, bumping up against each other <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in, 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 in this big human experience, right? So, so a lot of it is just how we choose to respond to the adversity we face, how we choose to uh, interact with those around us who maybe we do get frustrated with. How can we do that in a professional way? How can we do that in a gracious way uh, and, and in a, a, a forgiving and, and uh, courageous way? Uh, those are the types of things that we need to learn how to do. And just jumping ship from one place to another isn't going to magically change everything. Uh, the grass, as, as the saying goes, the grass... Mm -hmm. isn't always greener, right? Um, and again, now, if you're in a toxic uh, relationship, if you're in a toxic environment, you get out of there, you get safe. But otherwise, you know, look for um, what you can do to make your situation better where you're at. I am a, a strong believer in trying to make things as good as possible where you're at until the time comes where it really is a, a great opportunity to move on somewhere else. Um, right. And yeah, yeah, I want to I want to piggyback on that. I absolutely agree with you, right? If you're in a, a toxic, abusive situation, I encourage you to find the support and the resources to get out of it as quickly as possible. And I think that it is so challenging, right, to overcome those insecurities and doubts, right? Oftentimes, at least speaking from my own personal experience, when I've been in that situation, it can be really hard for me to separate the situation from my own internal stories. And what I mean by that is sometimes we think we deserve that situation. We think we have somehow created it. And in some cases that may be true, right? In terms of the stories in our head and 
our trauma response or unhealed trauma, as Rihanna Milne was mentioning on a recent episode of yours. I love that episode. Highly recommend it to everyone. Um, but I think it's so important to recognize those programs that are ruling our lives and leading our lives so that we can become aware and break through those to become the leaders of our own lives. That's why I'm so passionate about it. But I think it can be really hard. And I think we can recreate those situations when we do hop or jump ship. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely true. So I, the other thing I was going to comment on just from what you were saying there is you mentioned or you reframed the great resignation as the great awakening. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I completely agree. I think organizations are having to deal with a tight labor market. They're having a hard time attracting uh, and retaining good people. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I recognize that that can be very frustrating uh, for organizations and it's a huge challenge. And so from the one hand, yes, let's talk about it in terms of the great resignation. What does that mean for what we need to do? Um, but on the other hand, from the employee side, uh, this great awakening, we're realizing after 18 plus months going on, I guess, 20 months of a pandemic, you know, we had time to rethink our lives, our careers. We had a chance to really consider what we want in the work that we do. Uh, and people just are less willing to put up with crap <laughs> now than they were previously. Uh, and that's a lar one of the large drivers behind this great resignation is that people are just saying, no, I, I, I need flexibility. I need uh, an organization that cares about me as a person, not as a number. I need to be able to have the support uh, necessary to accomplish my personal, professional and work goals. And if, if people aren't getting it, then they're saying, yeah, I'm not going to put up with it. And I'm going to either do my own stuff. I'm going to hang my own shingle. I'm going to, um, you know, try the gig thing and, and do contract work, or I'm just going to go and, and look for someone else who, who will treat me better. Will everyone treat you better? Again, the grass isn't always greener. So I caution people, you know, who, who are thinking that, but uh, that's the reality that people are in. They've, they've, they've wakened up. And I, I talk about this sometimes. I've talked about it on the podcast before. I, I always talk about it with my university students. There, there is a certain segment of leaders. Um, they, it tends to be generational, but not necessarily generational, where there's this, this uh, frustration and lamenting around younger workers, uh, mm. younger millennials, Gen Z workers. And why, why are they so entitled? Why, why do they need to constantly be getting promoted? Why do they need to be jumping around? Why, why can't they just stick around and pay their dues? And so th there's this kind of a mentality. Mm -hmm. And my response to that always is, you know, just because you did it doesn't mean they need to do it. We have a whole younger generation that has gone to school and learned what, at least theoretically, what good leadership should look like. <laughs> and they, mm -hmm. and they have higher expectations. They're just not willing to put up with it. And so uh, if, if, you know, when my students leave the university and they go out to get a job, I tell them they should be really choosy, just like an employer is interviewing them for the job. They are interviewing the employer for the job. And unless employers can, and organizations can start to recognize and realize that and not just point fingers and say, oh, they're so entitled, they need all this attention and handholding. I'm like, no, that's not really it. They, they, they want feedback. They want mentoring. They want coaching. They want opportunities for career development. That's what everyone wants. That's what, exactly. a, good, that's exactly. what a good leader does. And if you're not <laughs> doing it, it's not their problem. It's your problem, right? Right. Exactly. I think you, you hit the nail on the head, John. I think that everybody wants these things and it can be somewhat, it can feel intimidating or triggering even to see people doing something that you want to do and you don't have the tools or you feel afraid to do it, that can be incredibly triggering. So I agree with you that everyone wants to show up and feel seen, heard, and appreciated. I think that is universal uh, from the human experience. And so I think it's all about yes and, right? Yes, as we enter into the workforce, and I can speak from my own experience, I was certainly guilty of get out of my way. I'm here to do some really cool stuff. And I didn't necessarily take as much time or devote as much intention to learning the rules of the game, if you will, learning the current systems, because I think that when it comes to innovation, we do tend to think, throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? Let's start from scratch. Let's build something that's never been built before. But there's often a lot of good in what does exist. And so it's really about, I think, this coming together and saying, yes, 
let's encourage younger people, you know, entering the workforce to learn the system before they come in and just throw everything out the window. And how do we be more understanding of, okay, if I'm feeling triggered by this, that doesn't mean that their behavior is wrong. It means I get to be introspective and look at what is it about this that's triggering me? And do I now feel empowered to speak up for my needs and my wants? And can I now have a choice in where I choose to work, how I choose to work, who I choose to work for? I think that's, it's so beautiful. I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, Bluer Than Indigo Leadership, The Journey of Becoming a Truly Remarkable Leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue. What some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There's no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of our problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary, everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. Yeah, absolutely. So, so these are some of the types of things we need to be thinking about amidst this great resignation or this great awakening, depending on how we choose to frame it. Um, one of the things in association with this, of course, is the pandemic and, and people over the course of the last 18 plus months have seen good examples and really bad examples of how organizations have responded to the pandemic and virtual or hybrid work arrangements and showing empathy and compassion and meeting the needs of their employees, right? And so what, what do leaders need to be doing amidst this great resignation um, now that hopefully, you know, God willing, we're starting to come out of the pandemic a little bit more, people get vaccinated, um, do what Not you need to do, yeah, keep everyone safe. And um, we're, you know, starting to get out of it. Some organizations are wanting everyone to come back in person. Others are saying, ah, oh, remote's working for us, so we're going to continue. Others want some sort of a hybrid arrangement. But in this kind of increasingly complex world of work, what do we need leaders to be doing? What kind of competencies and capabilities do they need to be further developing in order to navigate in this space? I think that's a great question, John. I think there are several things I would suggest. I think first and foremost, it's about that introspection piece for me. And that's what I work with clients on, right? That's the journey I'm on. I'm certainly as a leader, I'm not the, uh, the sage on the stage. I'm the guide on the side. You know, I, I make it very clear. I'm on the journey with you. And I'm learning and I'm growing and evolving as well. I don't have it all figured out, as you mentioned earlier. And so I think this introspection piece is really important because what we fail to acknowledge often is that our fears, our doubts, and our insecurities are actually dictating our actions and behaviors. When we react to situations or people rather than respond, we give away our power. We give away our ability to choose and be intentional on how we respond to that situation. So I think the internal work is really, really important to create the awareness around those stories, those narratives, and understand, let's say, as an, a tangible example, as a leader, if I am leading my team and thinking that I have to have it all figured out, I can't show any sort of fallibility. I can't show that I'm winging it just as much as everyone else. If we create that story around our ego that we have to show up a certain way, then what we're doing is actually hindering the opportunity for connection and trust and vulnerability, right? And we know, uh, thanks to Brene Brown and several other research researchers in this area, we know that vulnerability is not something that we want to wait for someone else to do. It's really the best way to create a strong, deep connection with someone is to take that first step 
and to be a leader in demonstrating that vulnerability. So I think leaders who pretend they have it all figured out right now, it's very easy to see through that facade. Whereas before, maybe it wasn't as easy to see because we didn't know as much or we weren't as experienced. And we know that living through uncertain and unprecedented times, no one has lived through this. Uh, No one has all the answers. And so I think just the recognition and being willing to join your people, right? Rather than maintaining any sort of hierarchical, elevated status above, quote unquote, above them in our traditional systems. I think joining people on the level where they are and welcoming people into your experience is absolutely critical. And I would also say, trust our people, right? We have incredible humans who want to do a good job, right? Whether you're a leader or an employee, right? We, we don't show up. And I think you've said this before. We don't show up thinking, how can I ruin everything today? Right? We want to do the best we can. But I think one of the biggest issues I've seen in leadership in the last few months in, in this pandemic is, yes, we're all tired of living through this pandemic. Yes, we have businesses to run. And if we think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we can't simply put all of this into uh, you know, a drawer in our desks and say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open my desk of you know, exhaustion, burnout, confusion, languishing at 5 p.m. when my workday ends, right? These are, this is the human experience. We, we bring that whole self to work. And I know, I know that's a big thing for you as well. And I think that's one thing that I've seen a lot of leaders neglect is, okay, we've been doing this for a long time. It's time to get back to work. And that's just not quite how it works. It's really about recognizing how many people are truly fighting for survival. If you are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right, at that bottom rung of the pyramid, and if we just keep telling people to elevate themselves, just self-actualize, just jump, it's not a hopscotch, right? We can't simply hop our way into self-actualization or focusing on the business again. And I think that we think we can sweep it under the rug and it just comes back to bite us. So I think acknowledging and sitting in the current situation rather than trying to leap ahead or you know, put it in a drawer or whatever it is, I think is something we can really all learn from. Everyone's sick of the pandemic. <laughs> Everyone is totally sick of it. I'm in Utah, just like this past week, we have still as many new cases uh, as we were having like this time last year, we yeah. still have as many hospitalizations. We're at capacity. We're still having a large number of deaths every day. And so people are acting like we're done. We're not done. And, right. and there's still consequences. And so uh, leaders, organizational um, executives and leaders need to recognize that. And, and even if they're done, they're, they're burned out from having to deal with COVID and trying to juggle everything. Uh, it, we're still in the middle of it. And there's still lots of people who haven't been vaccinated. There's still lots of public health danger uh, and all the corresponding effects of that, right? All of the, the social, emotional, economic hardships, all the things that are, are, are in conjunction with it. So we just need to continue to show compassion. We need to continue to show empathy, continue to, be, uh, to model vulnerability for our people and work hard to develop trust with our people so that they are, they, they do feel safe and comfortable to come to us when they're dealing with a challenge and we can support them and help them. So I think those are all great points you've raised in terms of what leaders need to be doing in this moment to increase their impact and their effectiveness. Um, we, and we've already talked quite a bit about why organizations seem to be struggling right now to attract and retain uh, good people. But any other thoughts around, you know, coming back to this, this notion of the great resignation, any other thoughts around what we can do to engender greater levels of loyalty and commitment amongst our people and to create a really great employee experience so that people do want to come and stay? Yes, yes, absolutely. I think we have this tremendous opportunity and I would love to see, I don't know if there's a a CEO out there of let's say a fortune 500 company bold enough to do this. Um, But I think leaders everywhere have an opportunity to shift the paradigm. When we think about business success, we are constantly focused on growth. And when we say that word growth, we tend to mean growth of the bottom line, right? Growth in revenue, top line, bottom line growth, And so I think there's a tremendous opportunity and I'd love to invite and challenge all leaders to think about truly shifting the paradigm 
in how we define growth and success. So I would love to see, don't know if it'll happen. I'd love to see these CEOs say, you know what? Our growth target for the next year is flat in terms of revenue, but our growth targets are growth in connection, growth in learning, growth in ourselves. Because I think oftentimes we hear what I call lip service, right? We call, we hear that performative, oh, make sure you're taking care of your mental health and your family and your well being after, you know, it's like, and now we have this aggressive deadline that you have to meet. And so it feels very superficial or in my perspective, hypocritical to say in the one breath, take care of yourself. We care about our people, invest in your well being. And we now need you to work long days, work weekends because we have these deadlines. And I think leaders have the tremendous opportunity to really take a step back and focus on how are we defining success? If we focus continuously on growth of the bottom line, what are we growing for? What are we growing toward? And I actually said this to a friend last night, you know, I've never seen a headstone in a cemetery that says, you know, beloved employee never took a vacation, but really increased shareholder value 3% quarter over quarter for 15 years. I've never seen that on a headstone. Uh, if you have, please send me a picture of it. But I think it's really our opportunity in this great awakening to take stock of our lives and what is really important. And as leaders, we get to, and we have the tremendous privilege and opportunity to lead that way and lead that paradigm shift. I'm so glad you said that because it's not strictly a Western culture thing or strictly a business thing. I think there is this kind of bias towards continual never ending growth and thinking that growth is the best, but is it really like, do we constantly need to be doing more, consuming more, producing more, um, you know, from, from a kind of a 10,000 foot view of just the world holistically that causes a whole lot of problems <laughs> and it's not sustainable. And I get it when you're, when you're a, a CEO and you're accountable to the board and you're trying to in increase um, stock value and increase revenues. I understand that. I, I get it. Um, but it doesn't have to be endless growth uh, to have a really successful, impactful business where you have a really great team putting out a really great service or product. Uh, where you're making a difference in the world, you don't have to just continually be growing. And so that's a really important point. And we can think more about sustainability. We can think more about growth and impact. We can think more about growth in um, the employee experience and in our relationships within the workplace. There's a lot of other ways we can frame it. And I think that's a much more healthy way to go about doing it. I think one other thing I would say too on that is, we have been conditioned to believe that we are playing a zero sum game or it's this or that, right? So I think the other point I wanna make very quickly is that when we focus on the employee experience, when we focus on growing and connection, when we focus on sustainability, spoiler alert, the bottom line does actually grow, right? When we do take care of our people, when, and so it's really just about reframing it into focus on our people, and then the results will follow. Yep, absolutely. Carissa, it has just been a true pleasure talking with you. The time has flown by and I'm noting that it's time to let you go and get back to your busy, hectic day. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time to meet with me and share your wisdom and insights with me and my listeners. Before we close though, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you and find out more about your work, your team, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. You can find my website, carissacarbon.com. I'm not, is if you get the spelling right, I'm not hard to find. Uh, LinkedIn, Carissa Carbon, Instagram, Carissa Carbon. Um, also want to share an opportunity. If you are a leader and you are interested in diving deeper into this introspective journey, don't necessarily know where to start or you've started and don't know how to accelerate it. Uh, I am hosting a leadership retreat in January of 2022 in Sedona, Arizona in the U.S., and it will be an immersive three-day experience for leaders to really uh, go deep in yourself and imagine the future and really take concrete steps to get there. So I invite you, if you're interested, to reach out. I'd love to share more details and see if you're the right fit. Final word on the topic is lead with love. I love it. Thank you, Carissa. It has been a pleasure. 
I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Chris and her team can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership, ordinary everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.